Okay. Uh, now, are we talking to our students too? I can see that uh, there, there, there is uh, 30, 32 participants. 35 now, uh, yeah. And yeah, must 33, uh, 32. Uh. Okay, let's start. Okay. It's, it's working, okay. So perhaps you, you can... Wagner, please, can you start? Yeah. Uh, to, uh, todo mundo já está ouvindo a gente, Rogério? Sim, sim. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I would like to start the seminar expressing our gratitude to Professor Eric Felipo, who accepted our invitation to give this speak for students and faculty of the graduate program in political science of the University of Sao Paulo. We are especially grateful to you, Professor Filippo, because we know that in your time zone, this talk is beginning at 10.30 p.m., which is certainly late for you. So we really appreciate your availability and goodwill. Professor Filippo is... Eric. Eric is professor and co-chair of the Department of Political Science at Paris Nanterre University. And he also is a member of the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences of the French National Center for Scientific Research, the CNRS. He does research not only on campaign finance laws and practices, but also on public integrity, policy, integrity policies, political professionalization, and policy evaluation. He recently published the book titled L'Argent de la Politique in 2018, and co-edited two other books with Professor Jonathan Mendelov from Hyder University in the US, uh, one of them are, is uh, the Handbook of Political Party Funding, also in 2018, and Political Corruption in a World in Transition in 2019. Probably this year is going to be published another book, uh, co-edited by Professors Filippo and Mendelov, uh, whose title is Populism and Corruption. Uh, I had the honor to contribute with a chapter to this new book with some colleagues from the Federal University of Paraná. Uh, the title of this talk tonight is going to be Sociogenesis of a Codification, the Regulation of the Financing of French Political Life. Professor Filippo, we suggest up to an hour for your talk and after the talk, we ask you to respond to some questions that our audience will probably raise. So let's now hear from our guest speaker, Professor Eric Filippo. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Wagner. Um, uh, in fact, uh, what I would like to, to do uh, with you is to present uh, um, a talk uh, explaining how uh, to think uh, sociologically about uh, the codification of uh, laws claiming to reform the funding of political life. And uh, uh, again, th thank you for offering me that opportunity to speak to you on a topic I'm passionate about, political finance. Uh, to clarify the meaning of my speech, I will tell you about a work, a work I published in 2018. This is uh, the first slide 
the front page uh, of the, the book, which is in, in French. Uh, but it is not so much a matter of exposing the results of this research to you as of presenting the approach that inspired it, because this perspective is not enough implemented by scholars. Most of the time, research on political finance is oriented towards a quantitative perspective, uh, financial data, which are now abundant, are used as an input for the analysis of expenditure returns processes, voting outcomes, etc. But lawyers also frequently takes up this issue by analyzing administrative and criminal courts decision and case law in order to show the discrepancies between practice and law, problems in the implementation of law, and even the imperfections of the later. But what often unites these works, quantitative and legal, is that they are not free of political and militant underpinnings in favor of such and such a reform or change in legislation. At the same time, this work, my work, uh, whose scientific approach I will expose, which is neither the fruit of a quantitativist researcher, nor the sum of work of a, a lawyer or a jurist, has received a prize awarded in 2019 from an anti-corruption association where we also find, it's a slide two, uh, um, famous or well-known politicians. Where is, where is the famous one? The famous one? In the, yes, in, in, you, you, you can uh, move a bit uh, here. Uh, no, 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 no. You have indeed uh, François Hollande, our former French president. And the guy uh, on my uh, uh, on my left, yes, it's Michel Sapin, uh, 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 one one guy who um, wrote uh, with other ones uh, the the first law Sapin one, which was a law against corruption in 1992. Voilà. So it it was just a, a way of joking. Uh, uh, that slide. But more, more seriously, uh, I think that the, the perspective in, implemented in my work would benefit from being more transferred to other countries in order to allow new comparison based on the analysis of the financing of politics. So, what does the approach used in my work consist of? It is relatively simple and classic. It, it corresponds to a sociogenesis of the codifications of the rules that claim to regulate political funding and to a political sociology, in fact, of the uses of these regulations as well as their effects on the functioning and transformation of the political field. In this sense, uh, political finance serves as a kind of heuristical tool to engage in the analysis of the functioning and transformations of the political field. And it is simply a matter, a matter of making it an object of study like any others in political sociology. This political sociology could also be uh, qualified, labeled as social analysis, social analysis of politics. I mean by, by that uh, an analysis uh, attentive first 
to socialized individuals, bearers of various dispositions. Second, to actors who make practices, representations, and institutions exist. And third, these actors, these practices, these representations, and these institutions forming together configurations historically situated and evolving in space as well as in time. And to be more transparent, the terms field and configurations refer to authors such as Pierre Bourdieu and Norbert Elias, even if my ambitions was never to perfectly transpose the, these analytical frameworks to my research object. That was uh, my introduction to explain from my point of view and from where I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I'm going to talk now. And I will develop two parts uh, and a conclusion uh, uh, now. Uh, firstly, uh, it could be useful to precise in you know, the first part, what does the sociogenetic perspective refers to in concrete terms when attempting to analyze the rules that purport to govern political funding? One first uh, idea. In terms of materials and sources, the sociology of the codifications of the first rules aimed at regulating the funding of political life leads to the manipulations of various documentary resources. It could be media sources. These materials can certainly be used as sources for example, to reconstitute the context of the vote of a law. But it is just as much a question of making the sociology of this information conveyed. The information surrounding the financing of political life is never neutral and free is part of a process of scandalization, often. It often takes place at the hurt of exchanges of political blows, of strategic interaction. And I quoted uh, at the end in the bibliography, uh, the works, uh, one work of uh, uh, Irving Goffman, who wrote something of, on strategic interaction, very interesting. And uh, a paper of a French colleagues, uh, now, now retired, Alain Garigou, but written in English on a famous French scandal. Uh, and that his work used uh, strategic interaction to understand the scandal and the, the, the information uh, developed around uh, a reform. So it is also necessary to be sensitive to the content of these messages and to their authors. The, this information participates in the construction of the financing of political life as a public problem. And here too, I'm very fond of the, the works of the famous American sociologist, uh, Joseph Gusfield, quoted in the bibliography who wrote many things on the symbolic crusades, uh, which, can, which can be uh, really uh, transferable to uh, our issues. Money becomes a problematic object in politics, but for whom and from what point of view? Is it from the point of view of its volume, the volume of money spended, spent? Or is it from some of its origins, 
corporate donations, for example? Is it a question of denouncing certain of its uses? For example, uh, buying votes, uh, paying too many posters, and so on. Do the problem put forward concern electoral campaigns, the financing of political parties, the remuneration of public officials? As you see, we, we could obviously continue to list the, the problems and questions. Perhaps we can leave it at that, on this point, and underline the extent to which money in politics as elsewhere is the subject of processes of social hearing. And here, to finish with a quotation or references, bibliography, you have a famous book from Viviana Zelizer, quoted in the, in the, at the end, which is very, very interesting on the, this issue. Uh, alors, and to what extent this way of spending it, spending money or collecting money, etc., are at one with a multitude of political crusaders, crusades that are inseparable from struggles of the same name. Second idea uh, to continue. This sociogenetic analysis can, of course, consist in studying the first laws, and I did it, and I will speak in the second part about it. Uh, first law uh, uh, enacted on political finance in France, it's 1988. Huh? But this way of proceeding can be broadened. It can be broadened in particular by making an inventory a list of all the parliamentary or governmental draft laws that have been previously uh, pushed uh, in attempted to reform this issue, but with, uh, without success. It is not uncommon for public policy analysis studies to operate in this way. And here, if you can uh, move, uh, yes, to the third, uh, the third slide, uh, it's, it's a French chronology. Uh, uh, and if we pay uh, attention, it's a list of parliamentary bills that I uh, found uh, uh, after uh, researches on the uh, tables, uh, parliamentary tables, uh, for a long period. In fact, I, I did the, that job uh, for all the Fifth uh, Republic, uh, French Fifth Republic, between 1958 to uh, 1988, because 1988 is uh, the first uh, law uh, uh, the first reform dealing with political finance in France. And uh, doing that job, that research, uh, in fact, I found about 30 uh, draft laws uh, from uh, one was a governmental project, uh, the other one were uh, issued by parliamentarians and the period uh, correspond to uh, uh, 1970 to uh, 1987. And if, if you pay attention, yes, to, to those uh, initiatives of reform, it's very interesting because you can see what are the, what the primary concerns of their authors are. Uh, you have uh, something written uh, in very dark. Uh, you can see uh, limit uh, uh, election campaign expense, uh, regulate electoral pro propaganda. Uh, ah, 
political parties and election, etc., etc., etc. It's very interesting to pay attention uh, to uh, how it's framed, uh, what are the issues uh, at the core of uh, those proposals. Uh, the, the titles are can be uh, significant. Uh, you, you can see that some focus on certain election, other on party finances, and in fact, gradually, we even can realize that these proposals end up integrating different types of election and political parties from this financial perspective. Uh, but it took some time before uh, uh, attending that uh, results. As diverse as they are, uh, their approach to political finance ultimately becomes standardized and homogenized. As such, the integrated income and expenditure from party organizations as well as candidates in all types of elections. Suffice so it also to observe that not one of these reforms proposals was discussed in the chamber, uh, in the National Assembly, uh, in fact, and that they all uh, demonstrate a broad consensus among the political elites to do nothing about it. It is most likely that even the initiators of these proposals knew what to expect their effort to mobilize parliamentary support were therefore highly symbolic. In the end, perhaps, it was mainly a question of provoking a political agitations for some and for others, a calming of a calming um, uh, and for other of calming a crisis by pretending to take hold of this issue. We must never lose sight of the fact that the French political system is such that the executive, I mean presidency of the Republic and government, hold the monopoly of the parliamentary initiative, since the parliamentary majority only supports the government by its votes. We are in a sort of semi-presidential system, and in that system, the parliamentary opposition and even the deputies of the majority hardly have the opportunity to make their voice heard. It is the executive branch that controls the initiative for legislation as well as the amendment and voting process. This approach offers several advantage, for me, four advantage. First, it makes it possible to identify actors, political, media, individual, collective actors, who become, or not, all the time, specialists in this issue. Second, it offers an opportunity to trace the very public career of this issue of political finance, which is political because it, it never exists in a self-evident, timeless, and abstract manner. Third, it can be an opportunity to evaluate whether certain political camps take hold of it rather than other. And fourth, finally, taking seriously these unfinished or failed rules leads to the question of the possible links between them and the first successful laws enacted in 1988. In this field, the legal scope of this document should never 
be overestimated. When one examines a good number of legislative proposals on this issue, one quickly realizes how soft this law on political financing is at this stage. Indeed, there is a lot of lyrical rhetoric, but few precise legal framework, few concrete sanction, and a lot of political motivations behind the incrimination pointed out. So nothing very technical, in fact. And often, the architecture of these texts and their overall volume are rather small and superficial. I, I, I didn't uh, uh, do this work uh, on the 30 or so bills that pur purported to reform uh, the financing of French political life between 1970 and 1988, but, and it, it is a slide four, uh, I have done it on a related subject of public property. Uh, it's uh, here, it's uh, because I'm working on parliamentary incompatibilities with pri private professional activities. And uh, I found uh, many, many uh, uh, parliamentary bills uh, on the, you can see a, a long period between the 1870, the third, the French Third Republic, and so the first true republic, uh, and uh, 1958, it's the beginning of the Fifth Republic. And you can see that uh, I found uh, less than 50 uh, parliamentary bills, and you can see that uh, all these parliamentary bills, the, ma the major part of those draft bills uh, are very, very small. It's less than five articles. Sometimes it's uh, on two pages and it's not uh, uh, law, it's politics. So uh, when it comes to enacting new rules in this area, it is true that it may be a, a matter of responding to practical problems posed by political actors who are both judges and participants in that game and who as such may also be interested in not over codifying rules that could expose them or create difficulties for them. But politicians' interest in acting and legislating can also be guided by the idea of fighting politically against their opponent. For example, by making new disclosure of source of funding compulsory. For example, by playing on certain criteria that come into play in the allocation of public funding to political party. For example, again, by deciding whether or not to limit candidates' campaign expenses, etc. In politics, we, we must never forget that it can be useful to appear as a white knight in the service of a moral crusade, especially in times when the boundaries between the political camps, the right and the left, why not, can tend to become blurred or lose their vigor for certain segments of the electorate. And in this respect, it is probably anything but insignificant that the first law enacted uh, in 1988 in France on political finance, uh, it corresponds in the midst of a period of cohabitation between a socialist president and a right-wing government and parliamentary majority. I would like now uh, 
to uh, expose uh, how I worked uh, on the, uh, those laws enacted in 88. Uh, this was a, a prelude, in quelque sorte, an introduction, uh, what I did uh, before uh, on other texts, other documents, uh, uh, before uh, taking uh, seriously into account uh, the debates uh, the, the, and the, the new law of 88. So it's going to be, uh, it's my second part, uh, and it's going to be a, a sort of plea uh, for a sociology of uh, parliamentary work, if you want. But I think that, that I did that job, uh, taking uh, seriously into account the law, but without embarking on a legal analysis of the law. Simply perhaps because I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a political sociologist. So to, to study uh, the, the emergence of, of a new, the birth of, of a new legislation, it is first necessary to reintroduce it in its context of emergence in connection with possible political uh, conjunctural issue. So here it's a, a long slide, this is the slides five. And I, in my uh, memory, uh, it's in French. I beg your pardon, uh, I didn't have the time uh, to translate uh, it, but I think you, you, I'm going to, to explain uh, what it contains. And I'm sure that you, you, you can understand as looking at the, the first column that, uh, it's a sort of chronology, in fact. Uh, I identify different facts, different events, which in, uh, with the help of uh, the media, the press, and so on, uh, and it helped me to uh, rebuild that context, the context of uh, that, those new laws uh, of 1988. In fact, uh, with the help of numerous journalistic sources, uh, I listed uh, government announcements uh, in that table, uh, uh, official meeting, uh, proposed law, uh, the setting up of political working group on the issue. Uh, you have also uh, uh, political and financial scandals, uh, which are mentioned in that chronology, uh, brought to light by certain newspapers. And, and this, it's not very, very difficult to do, but it's very in interesting because it makes it possible to reconstruct how progressively the question of the reform of the funding of political life ended up on the official agenda of the public authorities in the form, indeed, of a government bill, as well as its progress from uh, the date, that date, uh, between the National Assembly and the Senate, uh, discussing, amending, and voting uh, that uh, governmental uh, draft law. Well, this is important. I think it's, a, it's an important job to do. And secondly, we, we must also take seriously the architecture of the laws submitted for debate and the priority issues that they raise around the various articles of the law. Because in doing so, it is not a matter of committing a, 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 to a legal exegesis. It is simply a matter of appreciating what are the main practical and also political problems that are driving the public officials who are involved 
in this codification work. Uh, and this is the slide six uh, uh, just after. Yes, yes. And these are the, in fact, in 88, uh, the government uh, proposed two uh, bills uh, to the, the, the assembly. And you have here, uh, it's a, um, an organic law and a ordinary law. Uh, and you have uh, the main chapters of the, of the two texts. And you can see what are the main uh, issues. Uh, so it's in French, I, I beg again your pardon, but as you can see, it began uh, on the first, uh, le, le projet de loi organique uh, 1214, uh, the first column, it began with patrimoines, that means assets, declaration of assets of the French president, is the candidate to the French, uh, to the election uh, as a presidency of the French Republic. After the second question, it's uh, how to finance uh, uh, the presidential campaign, how to publish uh, uh, the, the, the account of uh, those candidates, the question of uh, public funding, Article 4, um, Chapter 4, um, chapter five, uh, declaration of assets of the elected president. No, it's, it's interesting because you have priority and things after. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's important to pay attention also uh, to uh, the architectures of the book. After indeed, uh, the most part of the, of the research uh, is going to deal with parliamentary debates. Uh, and we, we must uh, take seriously th those debates. For at least uh, perhaps three sets of reason. Uh, to identify, and it is the first good reason, it seems to me, to identify the number of speakers and their partisan political uh, affiliation. This makes it possible to uh, identify the political marking of the reform, the way in which the, the opposition, which is never in a position of strength by definitions, seeks to make its voice heard critically. Uh, it's the slide uh, seven. Uh, <coughs> voilà. Here, in fact, you have uh, the first column. It's uh, <coughs> um, parli uh, parliamentary groups uh, from uh, NI. It's uh, no affiliation after uh, FN, because we had at that time uh, elected uh, members of the National Front. RPR, it's uh, liberals, UDF, uh, it's centrist, uh, right centrist. After the UC, UREI and GD, it's special because it's in fact is a, the translation of the UDF, but in the Senate, it's only in the Senate. There is no UDF in the Senate, but you have those small structures. And after you have the socialist, communist, and the sun. And, uh, and I, I did the job uh, for the National Assembly and for the Senate. Uh, and simply, uh, um, I counted uh, interventions, uh, people, uh, interventions, I'm going to explain it uh, later. Uh, but you see people who are present in the debates, acting, doing something, and uh, their actions. And, and this is, uh, is, is interesting. I, I will uh, uh, explain why a bit later. But it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, first things uh, necessary to do, 
trying to identify uh, the, the actors of the debates. Uh, we, we have uh, 577 uh, MPs. As you can see, uh, they are not uh, all present and they are not all acting uh, during uh, those debates. And you can see also that indeed RPR, it's RPR and UDF, they are majoritarian. It's a majority at that time. Uh, in the National Assembly, the, their action is massive, more than uh, uh, about 700 intervention. Uh, if you see the member of uh, opposition, PS and PC, about 500. But what is interesting here, uh, you can see it's, uh, if you translate to the Senate, you can see that the opposition is uh, more uh, furious, um, more active uh, in the Senate compared to the National Assembly. Uh, this is truly interesting. Well, I said uh, three sets of reason, reason, and I explain uh, one. Uh, second reason, I think, to, to identify possible point, points of tension. Uh, because the analysis of the amendment process can be very heuristic in this respect. And it, it is a slide eight. Uh, of the presentation. Here again, I counted, uh, I, I looked the parliamentary debates. Uh, and in fact, you have uh, all the artic, articles of the law, art, art uh, and when it's avant and après, it's before and after, because sometimes some amendment said, uh, we are going to introduce uh, an article uh, um, an additional article before the Article 1 or after the Article 1 uh, with an amendment. So I counted here. And uh, in fact, uh, in the French case, it is clear, for example, that Article 7 and 9 uh, for uh, organic law uh, uh, are those that have obviously been the most debated. Uh, you can see uh, uh, 23 plus 7 uh, uh, and uh, 16 plus 28, for example. Uh, and um, though, uh, um, and it's in, in uh, uh, sorry, and in, in the organic bill, sorry, uh, uh, in addition to the declaration of assets of deputy, it's around the article seven. The articles relating to financing, to the financing of legislative campaign and the filing of the candidate's campaign account, it's the article nine and 10, it's those articles which gave rise to significant parliamentary mobilization, uh, which is reflected in the intensity of the amendment work. This is interesting because not all the articles are debated like that. And we, we can see, we can uh, uh, identify where is the fight, where is the problem, where are the, the problems, where are the tension, on what sub-issues in sort. Uh, uh, and uh, as for uh, the ordin ordinary bill, on the other hand, the modalities surrounding the declaration of assets of elected officials, it's Article 2, uh, the last column, the, uh, you see uh, Article 2, uh, 12 am am Amendment plus one and so on, uh, as well as the setting of the sanction in case of non-compliance with the obligation to fill it and on the other hand, 
that of the lump sum reimbursement of part of the campaign expenses of deputies and principle of state aids for party financing and its distribution. It's the articles five to seven, uh, article five to seven. These are the main issues, the main problems. It's here where the, the, the controversy is uh, the most important. So the major points of concerns for parliamentarians were revealed. Uh, disclosure of their assets, publicization and supervisions of their campaign finances, and the introduction of public aid to parties, the calculation and distribution of which were all the more debated because they would condition the future resources of the partisan organization of the protagonists of the debates. Finally, and this is the, the third reason, and perhaps the most important uh, in my view, uh, this work on parliamentary debates makes it possible to link the work of codifications to the actors who are at its origins. It is not self-evident <coughs> to ref reflect on the good reason for action by parliamentarians in assemblies. Debates uh, on a text are never orchestrated in a free and random manner. The, the leaders of the groups decide on strategies, assign roles, and calls on their members to vote on important issues and ensure that their lines of action are implemented with their elected colleagues and their staff. The rules of the assemblies constrain these exchanges of blows by restricting the number of speakers and influencing the length of the exchange. The political balance of power determines how well these exchanges take place. The majority members of parliamentary are more likely to support the text presented by the government, while the opposition member generally take a more critical attitudes. Most of the time, therefore, the parliamentarian present in the hemicycle and who make the floor uh, and who take, sorry, the floor are not there by chance. Some have been given a specific role and have even received instructions and messages to convey in the arena. Some parliamentarians are present and active without having obtained the approval of their group or because their presence is tolerated, but within certain limits. But these debates only bring together a minority of elected representatives. 188 parliamentarians spoke in committee or in the tribune of one of the two assemblies. If we can't count the amendments, requests to speak, and interruption recorded both during committee work and during debates in the assemblies, only 32 deputies and 13 senators have made a minimum of 10 or more interventions. If we consider the more technical drafting activities, such as amendment work, barely 30 or so tabled at least one amendment in committee or in the assembly, just over 20 in committee and in the Senate. Senate. So only a minority of elected officials are therefore really active. It's the slide nine. 
you see uh, number of intervention per member uh, call to speak and interruption uh, really it, it's a, it's a it's a process of mon monopolization in sort uh, we, we have here a proof that uh, it's a minority which is able to monopolize the, the debate, uh, the speeches, the amendment, and so on. These participants form the raw material of the sociology of parliamentary work. Uh, this sociology endeavors to link the content of a law to the social political properties of the elected official it has mobilized often omitting the question uh, sorry of, often omitting to to question the process of distribution of role and speech of division of political labor at work in the parliamentary chamber but one could just as easily think about the orientation of a law by questioning the major absentees of the debate that contributed to its co-production. How could a text intended to reform the funding of electoral campaigns and political parties not mobilize a whole series of specialists in these questions? I'm thinking about treasurers of parties, treasurers of national campaigns, such as, such as the presidential election, as long as they hold a seat in parliament. However, among the deputies of the moment, we note the absence from the debate of guys like Gérard Longuet, perhaps you, you don't know him indeed, but Gérard Longuet was a French MP in 88, and he was treasurer of the Republican Party during the 80s. And here, nothing. He's not among the 129 uh, MPs of, of, of the list, we will see it later. It's the same for Robert Gallet, one famous treasurer of the RPR, the party of Jacques Chirac. Jacques Chirac, prime minister pretending to reform political finance at that time. Jacques Barrault was not very vocal, but he was at that time a deputy and the general secretary of an, another, an, an, another famous centrist party. You can add some other major players in the presidential election of 1981, which is very close from 1988. Uh, Paul Quilles, Jean Glavani, Pierre Bérégovoy for the PS, and who had a famous mission function during that campaign to find money, uh, to spend money, and so on. Uh, some of them ha had uh, later problems with the justice for political finance. Uh, well, and I think it's interesting to, you, you see what I mean, uh, to pay attention not only to the guys who are active during the debates, but to find uh, who is not here and who should have been here to, to do something, to say something. Because the absentee also say something about the limit of these debates and about the reformist intention that underlies the laws. But well, if we focused on the, uh, these most active figures in the debates, 
one is faced with a rather heterogeneous set. Uh, it's the last uh, uh, slide. Uh, I'm going to translate, but what I can say uh, in touch with that slide, it's, it's very difficult to, to find a, a sort of order uh, in that group of guys, because you, you have some MPs uh, who began their career, their political career in the 50s, others in the 60s. But you have two uh, other MPs who have barely two years of experience and one legislative election under their belt. There are prominent political figures alongside total unknowns. While uh, many physicians, parliamentarians are involved in public health issues, debates, the reform of political finance clearly does not attract parliamentarians who also work as accountants. I found one, a guy from the National Front, Pierre Descaves, uh, who was very interesting because uh, <laughs> he was perfectly knowing about uh, um, uh, the issues and the subtleties uh, of the, the accounts and the political accounts. And he, 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 he submitted a lot of questions, uh, very uh, precise, uh, um, who creates, created problems uh, to, to, the minist to the ministers. At, at the same time, the, the most active parliamentarians we, we, we are faced here uh, have good reasons uh, to have developed a sensitivity to the problem of political finance. And in fact, two profiles emerge, it seems to me. On the one hand, uh, elected officials who have encountered personal electoral difficulties, particularly at the beginning of their parliamentary career. On the other hand, Parliamentarians who are often better established, who have managed to take on partisan responsibilities and who have found themselves confronted with problems in the context of these collective responsibilities. I'm not sure becoming treasurer of a political party is a pleasure for everybody. <laughs> to translate my idea. <laughs> Thus, out of 32 active MPs, 10 began their parliamentary career in 1986. It's very close from 1988. But what is interesting in 86 is that they were elected by proportional representation because uh, um, uh, the ballots suffrage uh, changed in 86. Uh, and this had a consequence because uh, with that system, uh, your district is not uh, small. Your district is a, a department, it's bigger. And in fact, in, consequently, to be elected, you have to pay more because you have more voters uh, to enroll. And so, so a lot of these guys uh, entered in politics at that moment and with special financial practical difficulties, I mean. And it, 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 uh, it impacted them. And perhaps it, it structured their relationship to political finance. And uh, um, uh, 
but uh, half of them managed to get elected after overcoming difficulties with financial translation. Many of them invested in one or more electoral competition with no money and learned to fail before getting elected. And for others, the first campaign was the right one, but it was a hard fought victory against a well-established incumbent or one with powerful supporters. And in that list, uh, in fact, you don't know the guys, but for example, there's a guy named Jean-Louis Masson who won uh, when he was candidate for the first time. Alors, Masson, uh, pop, 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 uh, yes, it's here. He, he won, he, he was candidate for the first time in 1978, but he, he had to fight against uh, a woman, very, very famous, powerful, an ex-minister. And he, he, his victory was uh, very thin. And surely it impacted him. And uh, if he's interested in uh, codifying political finance, I'm sure that he's got personal reason linked to his uh, electoral experience. There is a... a Another woman, uh, I, I don't know uh, if you can move a bit. Uh, I don't remember her name. No, I don't. Can you um, move again? Perhaps she's not here, but uh, because she was not very, very uh, excited uh, in the role. No, again? No. Uh, Emmanueli, Emmanueli, it's a, it's a famous one, huh? uh, but uh, it's the same case as Masson. You see, uh, he was elected in uh, '78, but uh, it was difficult for him to to win. He won, he won, but uh, <laughs> uh, well. Uh, je, Uh, I, I remember, I can speak uh, uh, briefly uh, 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 about Bussereau. The, in the list, there's a guy called Bussereau. Yes, it's here, here in 86. And in fact, that guy, you see, échec in 1981. In fact, uh, he failed. He, he tried to, to get elected in 81 uh, at the legislative election, but uh, he, he had to fight uh, at that time, uh, Jean de Lipovsky, that guy was a famous uh, resistant, a Gaullist, and an ex-minister. He had a lot of money, and indeed also uh, money from the government, cash money from the government, to pay his election. And uh, I interviewed Bussereau, for my research, because that guy was the French MP who introduced an amendment which authorized corporate donations in 88 to parliamentarians. So it's very interesting. Why you? And uh, I'm not a psychanalyst, but <laughs> when I discussed with him, talk with me about his first campaign uh, and uh, about the uh, inequality, inequality and justice. He was not in a, uh, he, he was in the majority, but he was a centrist, not a liberal, not member of the RPR. So he had no money, uh, no personal money. He was not rich and he, he received no money from the government. We, we called it a secret fund from Matignon. But his opponent was rich and had the possibility to receive uh, uh, secret funds from the government. So he said, 
that's unfair. And the only one solution to escape is to be able to find other resources, other resources, resources from corporations. We must authorize uh, those fundings. Uh, you see, uh, how, uh, the exercise I, I, I did, in fact, uh, I tried uh, to uh, link uh, uh, personal, and it's not only personal, individual experiences, it's a collective history too, uh, to, to understand, to be able to understand uh, um, some aspects, some dimensions of the, the debates and of the laws but uh, linking those dimension to the guys behind and to their personal and collective political experience. Uh, well, to conclude briefly, because I'm, I'm too long, uh, you understood that from this point of view, it is possible to decipher the debates surrounding the 1988 laws in the mode of an enterprise of codifications of ordinary political experience that does not say its name, guided directly by the protection of the practical interest of the parliamentarians who are in charge. This activity often even taking the form of a work of loopalization. Uh, this conclusion is important it makes it possible to avoid two problematic readings of any reform. The first one consisting in a juridical reading, according to which the making of a law would be purely and simply guided by a technical legal reforming concern without any political motives. The second one consisting in an overly strategic, even Machiavellian rereading reducing legislators to calculators driven by their own political interests. In fact, sociogenetic analysis allows us to understand to what extent their reform proposals refer to individual and collective political histories and passes, and to what extent they reflect political experiences that are often denied because in politics, is it possible to glorify past failure or even form of financial malpractices to which one has had to resort? However, some parliamentarians end up becoming expert on these financial issues and the work of loopalization that goes with them. And these experts can end up claiming to have a monopoly on this issue, provided they manage to get re-elected and stay in parliament. The necessarily imperfect rules, vague, to be interpreted, not always easy to implement, etc., that they help to shape, give rise to litigation, especially during election. And these disputes call to other experts to intervene to say the law, in particular, these experts of the jurisdiction, Constitutional Council, Council of State, Administrative Court, not to mention the Criminal Court. There is also much to be said about the affinities, the ties of complicity, but also the tension linking the different actors in this field of power, I mean elected officials and magistrates. I will limit myself to alluding to the way in which in 1995, the Constitutional Council validated the campaign account of the candidates for the presidency of the Republic, disowning the work done by its rapporteurs which nevertheless revealed, we knew it recently, eh, in fact, uh, revealed that several accounts 
exceeded the selling or even involved financing of dubious origin, which should normally lead to reject rejection and ineligibility. Under this condition, it is easy to understand how this issue of political financing can be described as a never ending story. I should have told you about the other two parts of my research. I should have mentioned the uses of this financial right, laws, regulations, and its implementations as I did by interviewing candidates financial agent. There would also be some very nice comparative works to be done there, I think, I'm sure. It should also, I should also have addressed the question of the effect of these rules on the functioning and transformation of the political field. And in my research, the study of the accounts of French political parties allows me to illustrate that point. But I will leave it at that, thanking you for your attention to my too, too long speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Philippe for your very interesting, interesting talk and for your original approach of the problem. And now I would like to know if you have some questions. Uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, a student, uh, Moacir, mm -hmm. is asking you if you see any similarity between the uh, semi-presidentialist system in France and the presidentialist system in Brazil, in which the president is too strong, but it, the, uh, he depends, he or she depends on the a majority from the parliament. I'm, I'm not a specialist on constitutional law and of your political system, but uh, uh, in fact, uh, what I can say for France is that our president, uh, indeed, if, if there is a, a, a convergence of majority, of course, how, I mean, if our president uh, have uh, behind him uh, uh, a majority of MPs, is the chief. I mean, he's able, in fact, to decide who is going to be the prime minister and he can control, in fact, uh, the government, uh, the constitutional government. But well, in 88, uh, Mitterrand was elected president, but uh, he was not able to have a majority in the National Assembly. And he was, uh, sorry, in 86, in 86. Between 86 and 88, uh, uh, he was uh, supposed to be the boss, but uh, in the National Assembly in 86, the, the right uh, which won. And Mitterrand was obliged to nominate uh, the chief of that ma parliamentary majori majority. That chief was Jacques Chirac. And in fact, uh, Jacques Chirac was the boss. The, um, we, we had only a problems uh, in our French constitution, some uh, area are not clear. It's defense and uh, diplomacy. Here we have shared uh, powers and uh, Mitterrand uh, was able uh, to uh, symbolically uh, to to act as if he was the chief of the diplomacy. And the, 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 uh, a, few, uh, a few weeks after uh, the presidential election in uh, 86, there is a, a, J, a J, J7 uh, summit in uh, Japan. And uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, 
Mitterrand went there uh, because he was the French, uh, the president of the French Republic, and uh, Chirac asked uh, Jap Japanese authorities uh, to come uh, also with the same protocol and so on. But they said, no, no, you are the prime minister. Mitterrand is the president, so it's different. You will have a smaller car, uh, less honor, and so on. Uh, you, you will not be invited to the table of the uh, major player. So Chirac said, okay, I will come later. And he came, but there is a big, big uh, press conference and Mitterrand was sitting uh, on the top and Chirac was sitting uh, <laughs> on the stairs uh, with a journalist and all the, 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 the French media show uh, those uh, pictures uh, showing uh, Mitterrand as a chief, uh, Chirac uh, sitting with uh, unknown peoples. After that, Chirac never did again uh, uh, a visit with Mitterrand uh, in foreign countries. But for all the other power, Chirac was the boss. He was the chief of the government and he was the chief of the parliamentarian majority. So I don't know if, if in your country, it can be the same, if you can have a dichotomy uh, of the executive, because for us, we have that dichotomy. And uh, sometimes <laughs> uh, the balance of power is not in favor of the uh, French uh, president. Can you see the question that uh, our colleague Bruno Speck raised? Uh, P and A, uh, if you click it, P, Q and A, you, can you click there and see the question? Ah, yes, okay, okay, uh, I, I, sorry. Uh, yes, I, I can see. Uh, uh, Two questions from Bruno Speck. Uh, he's a professor, our colleague. Okay. Yeah. Ah oui, I know it's, uh, it's, it's Bruno who was also... Uh, ah, you saw him yeah. in Heidelberg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, I think, yes, it's... Uh, I, I, what I wanted to... In fact, to, uh, to explain, because uh, when I'm reading some works on uh, political finance, indeed, there is a, a lot of works and uh, many papers or researches are less interesting or less concentrated on the origins of laws uh, um, when they appear for the first time and uh, less interested in uh, what, uh, what happened before. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm sure, I, I know a bit uh, your country for political finance, and I'm sure that uh, your country have a, a long history too on political finance. Uh, many reforms, many changes, uh, uh, have you, uh, are you authorized to spend corporate donations uh, in Brazil now? Is it authorized, corporate donations? No more. No Since more, no but more. one time it was yeah. authorized. So it's very interesting because uh, you experience uh, uh, important changes in your legislation too. And, and I'm sure that it could be very interesting uh, to study uh, exactly on the same base uh, those reforms in, 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 uh, in your country and in many countries. Um, I don't know if it's exactly, exactly the, the, the question from uh, Bruno. Uh, um, uh, but is right, uh, effectively. Uh, I don't know if, uh, I think that uh, the topic, the issue of, of political financing is a bit special because here really, it's an issue where uh, the parliamentarians, as I said, are judges 
and party. Jugez party in French, we said. Uh, sometimes when, when you, you codified, when a MP codified uh, uh, on, uh, I don't know, if, uh, health, uh, health problem, uh, sometimes you have MPs who are not uh, physicians, legislators. Uh, and they can have something interesting to, to, to say. And uh, so uh, they are not like that judge and party on the issue. And I think it's a difference, uh, perhaps a difference, which is important. I mean, it's, uh, but indeed, uh, all the questions uh, who are only uh, all the issues, uh, parliamentary issues, uh, uh, like that, uh, on political finance, uh, um, uh, uh, redistric redistricting, uh, vote, uh, circumstances, circumstances. Uh, I think uh, here we can find uh, common figures uh, or common characteristics. I think that. Uh, I'm not finding the good word, words, but uh, what I want to say is that political finance is a special issue, surely, but in, it's an issue in parliamentary in uh, in uh, in politics, which is common with other uh, political issues, like uh, vote, uh, registration, uh, uh, suffrages. Uh, incompatibilities, uh, political ethics, and so on. So it's separate and common. And I see that there is another question. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, policy field of political reform. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, in, in, uh, in 88, uh, that field is uh, narrow, I think, because uh, essentially we have uh, politicians. Uh, now we are uh, 40 years after, and we have, uh, uh, notably, we have, we, we created uh, special institutions to uh, monitor uh, political finance. Uh, so there, there are uh, civil servants. Uh, we have also um, uh, associations specialized uh, to f in the fight against corruption. So it changed a bit. I think the, the field is more opened more diversified. Uh, I mean, the field of activists, reformers. Uh, but you know, in France, even if it's uh, larger now, uh, it's not. Uh, I think it's uh, it's not a field very very developed. Uh, I mean, compared, for example, to the United States, where you have a lot of think tanks uh, specialized on political finance. Uh, uh, political probity and so on. I hope to, to answer. Uh, yeah. Do you still have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to know if uh, the regulation of political finance in France is still is a hot topic or are there a high level of consensus around the existing rules? Uh, is there any movement to change and better the law or not? Uh, are there any criticisms as regards to the financing of political campaign in France now? If they do exist, which are they? Uh, I don't know if I can answer truly to your, your question. Perhaps first point, uh, there is still uh, uh, many criticism uh, because, uh, as I said, uh, when when I arrived uh, uh, this evening, uh, the, the trial uh, Big Malion, 
Big Malion, it's the, uh, the campaign of uh, Sarkozy for the last, in 2000, 2012, uh, he was supposed to spend uh, 20 million uh, euros and uh, finally he spent 40 million. Okay, so, uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's an unfinished story. So uh, it's, it, we have always uh, political scandals uh, uh, and uh, uh, we, we have also a serious problem with the National Front. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, for ordinary people, this is an important question, really. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, for parliamentarians, uh, shut up. <laughs> Everything is okay. Uh, so th there is uh, no uh, mobilization, no, no political mobilization uh, to reform, to change. But perhaps uh, in a few years, in fact, surely in a few years, uh, things will evolve again because, as I said, I, I'm not the only one to say this. Uh, Pinto Dushansky and others are able to say it's a never ending story because, I, as I said, uh, we, we, we have uh, law who are uh, loopalized. Uh, so we will have litigations again and again. And uh, to litigate, that means it's to the jurisdiction to say what is the law. And uh, I'm sure that if the, if the jurisdiction take that power to say what is the law, it's going to create problems to the politicians and politicians will take the opportunity to reframe new law, <laughs> loopalized, uh, giving uh, new activities uh, to jurisdiction, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, um, and, I, and I, seriously, I think that uh, like in other parts of the world, uh, the main issue are not uh, elections, uh, political funding, and so on. It's, it's, uh, the agenda is not here. The agenda, it's uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, vaccination. Uh, you know, we are supposed to vote uh, in June in France for re regional election. Uh, in, often these these election is not well known, not very very famous, but I'm sure it's going to be a catastrophic uh, yeah, with a, uh, a level of participation very very low. Uh, surely uh, extreme right uh, Le Pen uh, very high. It's going to be uh, unpleasant. Uh, uh, and uh, indeed, we, we saw, uh, we are able to, to see uh, many uh, big fighters who are preparing uh, the next presidential election. But... Uh, uh, can you see the last question from Arthur Guerra? Uh, uh, quick Q&A in general. Ah, uh, it's, uh, there is two, uh, two, okay, okay, sorry, uh, in, 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 on my uh, ecran, uh, yeah. okay, it's Arthur uh, Guerafilio? Yes. Okay, when drafting, we drafting competition, oh, what are the value that legislators aim to protect? Do they also make reference to criminal corruption? Uh, uh, in fact, no, uh, bribery, it's um, all time. Uh, even if it, it if we we had recently uh, a, a nice uh, trial with uh, Dassault. Uh, Dassault. Dassault, it's a famous uh, uh, plane builder, uh, and he, he was elected mayor of uh, Corbeil Essonne, and in fact. Uh, 
he, he was supposed to, to spend uh, 50,000 euros to get elected. His account uh, declared uh, 49,000. And if I, in fact, uh, after investigation, we, they found uh, millions of euros uh, spent for his election. It was for, uh, to, to get elected the mayor of a small town. <laughs> he was racketed by gans gangsters <laughs> to pay voters. So um, the guy was very old. Uh, perhaps he finished to be uh, buried by uh, those pressures. But in fact, uh, no. Uh, uh, criminal corruption, uh, I think. Uh, I've seen a, a, a book uh, on mafia cartels uh, in France. I think it's, it's, uh, it's different. Uh, in France, corporate donations are supposed uh, to be uh, forbidden uh, since 1995. Uh, so uh, Officially, that doesn't mean that sometimes uh, money, uh, uh, cash money, uh, arrived in a politician's pocket. Uh, but uh, well, in fact, we, we know that uh, the, 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 because we still have big, big trials, but uh, money from Gaddafi, it's a uh, arms uh, contract, uh, petrol contract still have uh, sensitive questions, uh, but um, the problem is, uh, the problem, major problem is uh, we, we, we created uh, uh, laws, but uh, we have no real uh, structures able to control, to investigate. So, uh, it's it's uh, the French. We, we the acronym is CNCCFP. It's a national commission uh, specialized on uh, political finance. But that commission uh, has no power to investigate. She received uh, accounts and she controls formally, often. And uh, there is a team. Uh, linked to, uh, I don't know the, how to translate, parquet financier. It's a special team, uh, uh, it's a penal uh, penalization uh, and with special police forces, but it's, it's a small, small team. Um, but that small team is very uh, uh, active. Uh, they, they, all the different um, scandals, uh, Fillon, uh, Sarkozy and so on, those guys were on the on the file, and uh, they investigate, and uh, they succeeded in. Uh, but that does not mean that uh, the action will have an impact on the legislation uh, on political finance. In fact, unfortunately. Perfect. I don't know if uh, Rogério wants to say the final words, or Rogério. Hi, Wagner, please tell you the final words. Okay, so uh, Professor Filippo, thank you very much for our time. You know, it's now more than uh, midnight. In but, but my problem is now I'm awakened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your uh, talk. It, it was very interesting and original. And we would like to see you here in Brazil uh, when the pandemic finishes and maybe we can get together here. After your talk, we could go to a restaurant to, to have a meal and drink uh, wine and uh, talk uh, to each other. Thank you very much for your presence here. And uh, it's, it was a pleasure to, to hear from you. It was a pleasure for me to, uh, and thank you re very, very much to, for your invitation. That was very, very kind. And uh, I hope to, uh, to cross you again uh, and some of your colleagues, uh, uh, perhaps uh, virtually before uh, re really. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
Thank you very much. Have bye a good bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to everybody. Bye.